Hi there and welcome to the Markets UK podcast where we give you a quick burst of history, politics, economics and insight. And I, I want to talk today a little bit about the illusions that we create for ourselves when it comes to thinking about uh, the economy. We do enough of that when we think about the economy of now, but we also mythologize and do plenty of myth-making about the uh, e economic situation in previous eras. And one of the prime examples of that is the retrospective analysis that most people place on Nazi Germany. And it's interesting to see what we can tease out of the assumptions that people have about how Nazi Germany operated economically based on the actual, or compared to, or contrasted with, the actual realities. A common misconception about Nazi economics was that, on some level, it cured the economic problems that had plagued the Weimar Republic and managed to do so without adding any extra capacity to the economy. Armchair admirers of the Third Reich concede that yes, the persecution of dissidents and the murder of Jews was terrible, but on the flip side, Hitler got the country back to work again. These observations are the result of hazily remembered GCSE history lessons, and they rarely come with enough of a critical evaluation to suggest how Hitler managed this feat. It is odd in the extreme that otherwise liberal-minded people today seem reluctant to accept that as with most other aspects of Nazism, the economics of the Third Reich were an experience in style over substance. The dominant narrative that we've chosen to explain Nazism tends to give Hitler the benefit of the doubt on issues such as unemployment and inflation, suggesting that part of the key to economic salvation of a country is the adoption of authoritarian methods. It may often be tempting to think this, especially when the media constantly presents us with stories about the idle poor who do little for their daily bread except live off others. We react in frustration too when a seemingly simple act on the behalf of government that could save hundreds of jobs is neglected and the country sinks deeper into economic gloom. It is at these moments that the armchair dictator in all of us is awoken. I have in the past myself uttered the immortal words, if I ran the country. However, we have to see beyond the facade that the Nazis created in the 1930s, a propaganda act which, judging by popular reactions today, has been remarkably successful, and see the structure of Nazi economics for what it was, a fraud. If we can do this, it might well give us insights into the often intractable nature of economic problems today. The first sacred counter slaughter is the oft-cited view that Hitler got Germany back to work as propaganda newsreels from the time seemed to indicate. The Nazi labour force, the RAD, and Hitler's road builder, Fritz Tud, certainly did create a vast and expansive new series of autobahns. They tried to make the work as labour intensive as possible, avoiding modern technology. The Nazis believed that manual work had a transformative quality, and that one could find one's true Germanic self as part of the greater Volksgemeinschaft, or people's community, through back-breaking toil. It would harden the body and the will and subdue the intellect, which, in Hitler's opinion, as an anti-intellectual, was a key objective. They seemed to have ignored some basic tenets of Keynesian thinking, however, on the purpose of work as a reflationary tool. Keynes argued that it was better to pay a man to dig a hole and fill it in again than to leave him doing nothing. The issue for Keynes was that the individual was paid adequately by the state so that he could then circulate money throughout the economy through spending. The Nazis, wary of hyperinflation and the hyperinflation crisis of 1923 that had crippled Weimar Germany and led to the permanent alienation of Germany's middle classes, did not want to pump any new money into the economy. And also, when Hitler inherited the chancellorship, he discovered a country that was verging on bankruptcy. The idea that Germans should toil for the Reich and sacrifice was inherent in Nazi thinking and to incentivize work properly with decent rewards seemed antithetical to Hitler 
who was obsessed with introducing the German people to hardship in order to equip them for the struggles ahead and the sacrifices that he would demand of them during the wars that he had envisaged. So this led to a standard of work which, whilst not being compulsory for the unemployed, effectively became so with the implied threat of a labour camp if it were declined, and it was very poorly paid and short term. Capital building projects famed for their gigantism, such as the Zeppelin field where Hitler gave his Nuremberg rally speeches and the Berlin Olympic Stadium, were built at very little cost to the taxpayer, but the main benefit to the economy was missed. No one, other than the many crooks, spivs and embezzlers within and on the periphery of the regime, became any wealthier. The main value to the regime of this new spirit of construction and endeavour was in a propaganda value. It looked good and audiences in Germany and abroad were impressed. Our natural inclination both then and now seems to predispose us to thinking that authoritarianism gets results. By the end of 1935, over two years into the regime, Hitler was becoming aware that the popularity of the Nazi party was already in decline. The Nazis were acutely conscious of their popular standing with the people and were far less reliant on coercion than they were on cultivating consent. The initial excitement, enthusiasm and commitment that many ordinary Germans had shown for the regime began to die off as Nazism failed to adequately address the fundamental economic problems that faced most families. Claims that unemployment had been solved and the battle for work had been won felt increasingly hollow to families who, if they did have a breadwinner, were still mired in poverty. What gains had been made also were undermined by the steady rise of inflation that ate away at workers' living standards due to a lack of real growth in the productive capacity of the economy. Hitler learned about these dissenting attitudes days before his Nuremberg rally in 1935 and decided to change the topic of his speech. He had initially planned to speak out in favour of Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia, which he had been roundly condemned by the international community, but instead he chose to focus on the Jews. The Nuremberg laws preventing German Jews from marrying or having relationships with Aryan Germans and also stripping Jews of German citizenship were announced, the logic being that a public distracted by racial hatred would be less likely to focus on economic shortcomings. Productive capacity was added to the economy from 1936 onwards with the drive to rearmament. Hitler's finance minister, Hjalmar Schacht, thought that a vast increase in spending on munitions was most unwise and threatened to unleash inflationary forces. He was sidelined and forced to resign as more and more control over the economy was ceded to the bombastic Hermann Goering, who knew little, if anything, about economics. Rearmament was the means by which workers' living standards finally improved. Well paid overtime, particularly for skilled machinists, saw an increase in the amount of disposable income uh, available to families. But this, in turn, presented Hitler with another economic problem. Disposing of the new wealth was difficult without derailing Hitler's broader racial and militaristic goals. Firstly, although the Nazis had attempted to Aryanize the economy uh, by forcing Jewish shopkeepers out of their businesses or forcing them to hand their stores over to Nazi business rivals, people still shopped in Jewish stores until 1938 enjoying the quality goods and prices, and after 1936 they had the income to spend there as well. Secondly, Hitler's plan for autarky, to make Germany self-sufficient in preparation for war, whilst always being wildly unrealistic, was further undermined by the new affluence. Luxury items from abroad, American cigarettes, Belgian chocolate and manufactured goods from Czechoslovakia, were all in demand, and they led to a balance of payments crisis as gold reserves drained from the country. Hitler was desperate to build up those reserves in order to be able to pay for his future war, and his solution was to ban imports if an acceptable German alternative to it could be found. This gave rise to a range of ersatz products such as chicory coffee, which came, became to be despised by the German public during the war. Hitler never achieved the solution to the German economy before the war, the reality was that the war was the, going to be the ultimate solution. The quickest way to add productive capacity to the economy was through plunder. The first acquisition that economic and military planners were keen to steal 
was the Czech Sudetenland, with its manufacturing base and its Skoda factories. The German wartime standard of living was kept artificially high throughout the looting of the European economy. After the fall of France, over a third of the nation's wealth was exported to Germany in either reparations, plunder or unequal economic arrangements. This new prosperity lasted for approximately two and a half years and was cut short by massive Allied bombing and the disasters on the Eastern Front. It's hardly surprising that we fall for the illusions of the past and mistake them for being accurate versions of history, given that we're surrounded by economic illusions in the present, presented to us by government, corporate power and media outlets on an almost relentless basis. Myths about money, investment, property and the accumulation of wealth and power dominate contemporary discourse and it is the purpose of this blog to try to undo a few of those deliberate misconceptions.